Good morning. Welcome to the session uh, Lattice Algorithms and, and Crypto Analysis. The first talk is log estimate lattices using explicit Stickelberger generator to solve a prox ideal SVP by Olivier Bernard, Andrea Le Savouret, Seung Hui Wang, Adeline Roux Langlois, and um, the talk will be given by Olivier. Okay, thank you. attending Not today. Okay. Um, so as announced in the title we are going to <clears throat> so the slide of Okay, thank you. So as I mentioned the data, I'm going to talk uh, about the context of crypto analysis of ideal SVP. Um, then I will present the principle of uh, SUNIT attacks and in particular twisted PHS. Um, and I will talk about um, details about our work uh, towards going towards medium dimensions. Um, so <clears throat> let me go through uh, some definitions. So formally, uh, a lattice is a discrete subgroup of R uh, to the N. So you have a nice picture. Uh, well, I want to be nice uh, in for N equals two. And you can have a uh, basis and bad basis. Uh, the, the orange one is a good one, and uh, the purple one is probably uh, a bad one. Um, and the shortest vector problem is is an NP hard problem in all. Um, it's uh, asking you to find the shortest vector of the lattice. Uh, and you can relax this uh, by um, allowing some approximation factor. Um, and it's believed to it's believed to be still hard uh, for polynomial um, approximate factor in the dimension. So okay, for efficiency reasons in cryptography, we use algebraic structure light lattices. So this means that uh, yeah, you can have a grasp of uh, what is the structure uh, graphically here. Uh, but it's in of the of the multiplication is the number of fields. So you have an additional operation in your lattice. Uh, and you can also multiply lattices between them. And so the question is, uh, can we use um, this structure to better solve uh, ideal SVP? Uh, I mean, to better solve the shortest vector problem in these uh, lattices, in these particular lattices. And the answer was no for a long time. Uh, but in 2014, there was this quantum algorithm computing um, number theoretic uh, objects in a quantum polynomial time, large such as uh, S unit class groups. Um, <clears throat> these problems are, are classically hard to solve sub-exponentially uh, in, the, in the discriminant of the field. Um, and this is induced a, a long series of cryptanalysis works. And I hope that, that I didn't forget anyone, but if I did, uh, please write to me. Um, so, Okay, I'm going to, to give um, a, a, a picture summarizing the uh, cryptanalysis uh, this series. Um, I'm going to make some shortcuts and I will complete this later in the conclusions with recent advances. Um, so first, in the unstructured case, you have this uh, korkin zolotarev uh, trade-off, uh, which is um, telling that if you are, um, if you are happy with the uh, exponential approximation factor in the dimension, then you can do it in polynomial time. But if you want a better approximation factor, so typically a polynomial one, then you will have to, to pay for, for an exponential uh, time in the, in the dimension. So this is known as Schnorr's hierarchy, and we are going to try to beat this hierarchy uh, for ideal latitude. Um, okay. So the, the first the first uh, oh yeah the first generic 
um, for all lattices and a wide range of uh, fields, uh, which was fitting the, the North hierarchy, is the CW algorithm by Kramer, Dukas, and Veselovsky. So it was in 2017, and the uh, judicial revolution is uh, extending this in uh, last year. And this uses the short Stickelberg relations. And um, this says that if you have a quantum computer, then in polynomial time, you can probably find a sub exponential, uh, sub exponentially small uh, vectors in your lattice. So this was the first bridge into Snow's hierarchy. Um, okay. Um, later on, there was this proposal by um, Pile Marie and Rostele, which was extended to Steve PHS. Um, this is uh, maybe known now as the S unit attacks. So the formalism was uh, was uh, yeah was given in, in uh, it was underlying PHS and explicitly used in twisted PHS. And uh, this you have uh, this applies to any fields, but I am only giving here the picture for cyclotomic fields. Um, But you have to pay for an exponential precomputation. So this this means that you can do all an exponential precomputation on a fixed field, and uh, then you 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 will uh, have for each challenge a better uh, trade off than Schnorr hierarchy. Even classically, you have this zone here which you are beating the Schnorr hierarchy, and uh, polynomially you 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 have a, a, a whole range of other trade offs, and um, Okay, so the question is now uh, how threatening how this S unit attacks in quartics. So this is a little bit paradoxical because uh, we have, yeah, we are imag imagining that we have a quantum computer and uh, we are going to ask, okay, is this, uh, is this really bad for, uh, for, for ideal SVP problem? Uh, in particular, in twisted PHS, uh, we use um, another encoding of the problem and this gives uh extensive results in practice so i think the the main two experimental results are, that are uh, surprising is first the it seems that the log s unit lattice is very orthogonal you can see it on the on this very um special shape of the gram schmidt log norm and the second one is that the approximation factor that you obtain here in orange, so this is the, the very low lowest uh, line here. Um, this is a logarithmic sales, uh, scale, so the, there is a huge difference between the, the top curve and the, 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 the lower curves. And it seems to be growing very slowly in the way that could be sub exponential or polynomial. Or in, yeah. Um, but the problem is um, the caveat is that uh, it's. Um, it's only experiments in a small dimension and apparently it can be very misleading in this case. Um, so we need to gather more experimental observation before we can predict anything sensible. Uh, but the problem that we have is uh, it's uh, really hard to, to compute the, the objects that we need in the, in the classical world and climbing degrees is really hard. So this is what we do in, the, in our work. So we propose in the case of cyclotomic fields for any conductor, um, a construction, uh, which is a, a full rung family of independent S units. So I will maybe explain a bit later what it is. Um, this is composed of two parts. So first we, we take re, what we call a real S units. So you get a, a, a roughly a half of them, a half of your, your whole S unit group. Um, and so this is uh, the remaining uh, classical hard part, but it's in half, we have the dimension, so, so it's going to be easier. And we complete that by uh, explicit Stickelberger generators. So, um, yes, yeah, so we prove that by uh, giving an effective formula for the index, proving an effective formula for the index in the full Isenid group. And in particular, this is an finite index, so this proves the full rank property. And uh, for computations, uh, everything is going to explode and go wild. So we really need to use a, a short basis of the Stickelberger ideal. This will give you a small generator and uh, a few of them. Uh, 
Okay, these are two applications that we develop um, in our paper. So the first one is to remove almost all control steps in the CDW algorithm. So mainly uh, we remove the need for the random wall the relative space group. Um, yes, by using a uh, real class group relations. And we remove the, this CDW is a two stage algorithm and at, at between those two stage, you, you have a, a quantum um, step for solving the principal ideal problem. But since we have explicit generators corresponding to our relation, we can just compute that explicitly. Second application is to simulate the twisted PHS algorithm in medium dimensions up to 210. And this is a huge computational uh, breakthrough. Um, and we are able to confirm the, the geometry of the logistic unit statistics uh, is very particular, uh, as was noted in twisted PHS. And if you want uh, some theoretical explanation of that phenomenon, you should uh, go and see, um, the, go and read the, the paper by Bernstein and Lange. In 21. Um, and this is a graph. I'm going to go back later on that. This is a graph of the approximation factors that we, we obtain. And you can see that here you, we are going to, to have um, something that looks like a sub exponential or exponential shape when you reach, uh, as an, I mean, uh, meaningful dimensions. Okay, so <clears throat> may I explain? It's a principle, general principle of S unit attacks. Um, so you take a, a challenge ideal B, and you have first, you always have first uh, a quantum polynomial step. So it can be uh, computed by a sub exponential classical algorithm. And you decompose B on the factor base S. So you decompose B as a principal ideal, ideal part and a, a, a product of prime ideal factor base. And uh, the fact is that all solutions uh, to this decomposition are um, equal modulo multiplicative group, which is called the uh, S unit group. And then the, the aim is to find a short coset representative of this. Uh, of this uh, and so, so the, the, the technique is quite generic. You, you, you have to use some um, S logarithmic, uh, logarithmic function, which is. Uh, um, transfer your products into some. And the image of the S unit group under this uh, logarithmic function is called the log S unit lattice. And with, um, when solving a, a closest vector uh, problem, an approximate vector, a closest vector problem in this uh, log S unit lattice, you will obtain hopefully a short coset representative and you hope that this, uh, this is a short element of your ideal. So you can see that there are um, some important parameters to consider here. So the first one is probably, and the most important, probably the choice of the S logarithmic embedding. So in twisted PHS, we use the number theoretic weights. So this, uh, this allows you to make a wiser choice of, um, of relations. The second uh, important parameter is the choice of the factor base. So you can take a very big factor base or a smaller factor base. In twisted PHS, we chose to maximize the density of the log S unit lattice. Uh, and the last one, probably uh, the choice of your approximate CVP oracle. So you, depending on what price you are ready to, to, to put in that. Uh, in twisted PHS, we, we chose to use a somewhat uh, naive algorithm. We, we just use a randomized Babai's mirror plane. And in this presentation, we are also using uh, randomized by by neurons for our experiments. Okay, graphically, this looks something like that. You have the log S unit lattice here. This is an hyperplane orthogonal to the whole y one vector. Uh, let's take challenge ideal B. The quantum decomposition output, you can see that uh, you have uh, a principal ideal part here and a product of prime ideal in the factor base. And you use your favorite uh, logarithmic as embedding to obtain a point, the log of alpha zero here. And now you want to find the shortest uh, coset representative. And uh, so all solutions are on this line, so this blue line. Um, so this is just a translation by uh, some points in the log S unit lattice. And we hope to find the, the, the shortest one. So we'll project into 
uh, the log is unit that is um, find the s unit such that the logarithmic s embedding of this s unit is close to the um, to the projection so this will give you here uh, s equal to product of some prime in the factor base and then you can subtract this uh, log s to the log of alpha zero and this corresponds to alpha zero over s in the in the image uh, pre-image space yeah. and you hope that um, this is a short element uh, in the ideal so the other part is is now to you know how efficient this is the, the hard part is really uh, the main obstruction is to compute this log s unit lattice here so in our work as i said we, we have uh, this construction which is using a uh, real s unit so you will get um, roughly half of them and we have to complete that that family by, by uh, explicit generators and this is really how we break the, the IT barrier to get to get to dimension 200 and uh, the proof is the is about proving this theorem um, this, this gives uh, the, the index of the um, of this uh, of this construction the full S unit group and uh, this is not important uh, exactly the what is uh, the formula but we have to note that there is a huge factor here this is a relative quad group with a huge prime in it um, so this is really big and you have a huge part here of uh, powers of two and uh, we can manage to remove them um, so we will use uh, what's called uh, classically uh, two saturation techniques and this consists in detecting uh, in your multiplicative uh, family uh, some combinations of squares and once you have detected squares you can um, you can uh, you can uh, you can uh, complete square root and interiorize in, into in your um, in your family and everything is going to go wild though so you have to use short stickleberger bases to unlock high dimensions in practice so i i think i don't have the time to to present you what's a stickleberger ideal you should just know that uh, you can represent this as uh, vector on um, rational and you are keeping the com linear combination of these vectors that have integer coefficients here um, the second point to remember is that the Stickelberger theorem uh, tells you that these elements uh, give free relations in the class group so you take one ideal ideal like a Stickelberger element and uh, your resulting ideal is principal and the third very important point to remember is that the proof is completely explicit so you can describe and compute the generator but um, even with moderately high coefficients you will have a huge 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 generator so you have to to start as low as possible so yeah this is a work with um, radan kuchera and we, we we showed how to extract the short basis and um, we showed that uh, the, the, in that case uh, the generators are really easy to compute so experimentally we um, <coughs> yes we, we were able to you can see an example here uh, for uh, log s unit lattice of dimension uh, 1200 um, this is a shape of the gram schmidt log dump so this shows that this is really orthogonal and uh, this is a very general phenomenon so this confirms that uh, there is something going on with this lattice um, and second uh, we have this um, a graph of approximation factors so our densest approximation of this unit is the uh, yellow points here and you can see that uh, there seems no, not for this instance uh, this doesn't show a catastrophic impact of the of the of this S unit attack um, but this is neither reassuring because you, you yeah you can densify further your lattice or use uh, other arguments and uh, go beyond this this curve and the other point to to see on this graph is that there were a lower bound for the two-stage algorithm uh, CDW and this is uh, the green dot here and you can see that in some case uh, the, the twisted PHS uh, simulation here is beating this um, this lower bound so this shows the power of using uh, a, a unique lattice to to optimize uh, the, the, the output all at once 
So yes, it's time to to conclude. So I, I would like to to mention um, a recent conjecture by Bernstein, Eisentrager, uh, Rubin Silverberg, and Van Vrendendal. So this is a red star here. So if I I um, if I try to to give uh, the two main ideas of this conjecture, it's to use a sub-exponential factor basis, so very big factor basis, uh, regardless of the density of your log s unit lattice, and to use an enumeration-based uh, closest vector problem oracle uh, using many small s units. And the claim is that um, you can reach a polynomial uh, approximation factor in sub-exponential time. So this is under this has um, given rise to many debates in the in the community. There is no formal paper, but you have some code and description online. And um, maybe the main issue is that the experimental evidence so far are limited to um, to prime conductor cyclotomic fields of a degree less than forty two. So this might be uh, this might be subject to the same um, small dimension effect and twisted PHS. So this gives. Uh, yeah, this leads me to my conclusion on ongoing work. So the first item is to try to densify further the log s unit sublattices to verify the evolution of the approximation factor for, approximation factor for several orbits. And um, we we are almost there. So I think in one month or two we 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 should be able to publish uh, uh, what we obtain for saturating all factors of the of the relative uh, class number. Um, and the, the second is to build a, a practical simulator of S unit attacks in order to test um, other parameters and to, to try to explain better what, what is going on. And uh, the fact is that um, this paper that I'm presenting today um, provided a, a, a lot of, of data in, a, in a medium dimensions. And we should, uh, now we, we, we have to use that to support uh, and find finer heuristics and estimation. So thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach for me. Uh, we have time for one quick question. Yes. So I think many people may be wondering this, but uh, so do this type of attack, is there any hope to extend them to say module lattice of rank two? So uh, for now there is uh, no um, reasonable proposal to, to extend this to, to modules, yes. unfortunately. Okay. So let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so the, the next talk is on model unique SVP and NTRU by Joel Fedorov, Alice Polemari, and Damien Stelle. And the talk will be given by Joel. Uh, hello, everyone. I think my, uh, my uh, remote is not working. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. OK, uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for fighting the jet lag and the uh, tiredness to come and see me at the beginning of the day. So uh, I'm Joel Felderoff. I'm a PhD student of Damien Stelle at the UNS de Lyon. And I'm going to present you a joint work with uh, so Alice Polymari and uh, my supervisor, Damien Stelle, uh, which his name is uh, on module USVP of rank 2 and n So uh, this is actually a good. Um, 
a good sequence of presentation because uh, at the end of the last one, uh, we asked about uh, module lattices. And uh, so one of the goals of the presentation is to show um, some gap between uh, ideal SVP and uh, module SVP in rank two, which uh, basically answered uh, the previous question. So that's cool. Uh, first, uh, let, me, uh, let, let me present uh, the contribution I'm going to, uh, to explain in this talk. So uh, I'm going, uh, so um, here, uh, module uh, SVP of rank one is just a pedantic way of saying ideal SVP. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to present uh, some, uh, some lattice uh, problem, some module lattice problem that is equivalent that we show are equivalent to n true, which is a security assumption used in some, uh, in some cryptographic schemes. And uh, I'm going to we are going to show that, I lost my pointer, that uh, this, uh, this new problem, well, this problem has a good property, which is a reduction from worst case to average case. So first, some definitions. So Entruf was um, proposed in uh, 96 by uh, Oftine, Pfeiffer, uh, and Silverman. And uh, so here we are going to work on, uh, on polynomials. So uh, every, uh, every element of every lattice I'm going to present are polynomials uh, modulo x to the n plus 1 for n a power of 2. The size of an element is the L2 number of the polynomial. And Entru ask if I give you some polynomial H, which is equal to F over G for some small F and G, to find back F and G. So this problem has been proposed, as I said, in the 90s. Uh, it has an advantage uh, over other uh, cryptographic assumptions because it leads to very small keys. So basically, in that problem, the public key will be H, the secret key will be F and G. And so uh, F and G are rather small. Uh, it leads to fast encryption and decryption algorithm. And uh, it's quite old, so it has been studied a lot. For example, we know, uh, we know basically uh, what uh, modulus Q to take in order to be secured and stuff like that. Well, uh, actually, we know what modulus Q not to take to not be insecure. So uh, this problem seems a bit, um, a bit ad hoc, like we, I give you polynomials, uh, which are equal to uh, ratios of polynomials over uh, no, of uh, modulo, etc. So the question is, uh, can we relate this to lattice-based cryptography? The fact is, yes. If you want to analyze this problem, you can define a module, which is uh, basically uh, the set of, if I give you H, the set of all possible uh, secret key. So the set of every uh, F and G such that F times H is equal to G mod Q. This is a a polynomial lattice, so a lattice whose elements are all pairs of polynomials, of rank two, because they are pairs of polynomials. Uh, we call that a module, a rank two module, and it's generated by the basis uh, 1H, 0Q. So I take a column-based uh, column based element, a column-based uh, vectors. So this lattice has a, a good property, which is it has a very small uh, element in it. So if you look at, uh, if you look at lattices, if you take a a random lattice, you expect all the short vectors to be about the same size. Well, in Entru and in the, what we define as a module unique SVP of rank two, uh, you have one very short vector in one direction, like one very, very dense sub lattice, sub module, and we have uh, another one. So we get those non typical shapes of uh, modules. So uh, this has, this uh, leads us leads us to uh, to study more systematically those uh, those uh, lattices those modules. Uh, well, um, this is not uh, coming up from nowhere because lattices like that with uh, one short vectors and uh, and other uh, normal have been studied before. So uh, that's the unique SVP problem, and it is known to be uh, equivalent to uh, bounded distance decoding and SIVP at least quantumly. And uh, so that's for unstructured lattice, like Z lattice. Uh, for R modules, so for uh, polynomial lattices, well, this, is, this, this uh, was not studied to our, to our knowledge before. So we know that n true and uh, module uh, unique SVP of rank 2 are easier than module SIVP. Uh, harder, I'm sorry, than, uh, wait. I'm sorry. So we know that it is uh, those, uh, those problems are easier than module SIVP because there are instances of this one. 
Uh, we know since 2021, uh, since 2021 uh, by uh, Pelé, uh, Pelé, Marie, and Sele, that uh, n is easier than module SVP in rank one. And uh, that's about it. We don't know if uh, all those problems in the middle are equivalent. Well, be, uh, before that, we didn't know. Uh, we don't know if uh, module uh, SVP of rank one is equivalent to n true. Um, so, so that's what I'm going to, uh, to present you today. So uh, first, I will present a narrow from this one to this one, a reduction from module USVP of rank two to and through, showing that uh, those two problems are equivalent. And then I will show you that the worst case of module USVP of rank two is equivalent to the average case. OK, so, uh, so first, uh, module USVP of rank two is equal to n true. So our reduction works as follows. I, I give you uh, some instance of module USVP of rank two, and I want to transform it into some n true instance in order to make uh, an n true uh, solver uh, running and uh, to, to solve my uh, to solve my uh, beginning instance. So first, that's a bit of a technical detail, but for our reduction to work, so I uh, we are given a basis of uh, module USVP of rank two instance, which is uh, basically a two by two matrix with a polynomial uh, with polynomial entry, and I want those two polynomials to be prime to be co prime. So uh, in order to do that, what we're going to do is just to sample some small epsilon and to multiply our basis by the identity plus epsilon. Maybe we'll add uh, some multiplicative factor, but basically, if we do that, uh, we are going to change our basis. And with high probability, well, probability that is, uh, if you want to get into the details, uh, approximately one over the decay of two for case of number field we're studying. Uh, this uh, is going to make those two co-primes. Okay, so now I can uh, I can suppose, uh, eventually I will try again, try again, that's easy to test if those two are co-primes. Uh, eventually, when uh, they are co-primes, I can get to the to the Hermit normal form. So the, the Hermit normal form is a quite uh, classical thing to compute for a basis. It works for polynomials. It works for uh, every uh, for those, those kind of those kind of uh, things. So we are going to take the extended uh, Euclidean algorithm in order to put a one here by current operation. So there exists uh, a and b such that uh, a b one one plus uh, b b one two is equal to one. Uh, so I make my uh, columns uh, columns operation, and I put a one here. Okay, so now I take a column operation to uh, get rid of uh, one of B12 uh, in the column here, and I get this new basis. Okay, this basis is pretty similar to the entry matrix we had before, right? 1H, 0Q. The only big difference between the two is that B here is a polynomial, modulo x to plus one, and Q here is an integer. So uh, we want to transform this basis into some entro matrix. Okay, well, uh, the way we do it is, is a bit uh, brutal. Uh, so we take Q, uh, well, we uh, manage to have B is approximately equal to Q, and we multiply by Q over B, uh, all the bottom line. So when we do, and then uh, we, uh, and then we round. Uh, when we do that, if Q and B are approximately the same, it doesn't change a lot the shape of uh, the underlying module. And we even have an explicit, um, an explicit formula for the short vector. So now we've got some, uh, some intro instance. So H will be uh, the rounding of A times uh, Q over B. Q will be the modulus. And uh, if we find a short vector of uh, this in uh, in this central instance, well, we've got a short vector into the our previous instance. We won. Okay, we just transform this basis, this uh, this modules, which is the same as our beginning module, into an entry instance. We can solve it, and we won. We solved the uh, we solved the uh, module USP in rank two. Okay, so that's uh, that's good. Uh, now uh, I have my reduction. But module USP of rank two is not just a module problem equivalent to and true. It also has good properties. So uh, in cryptography, we like to have um, to have security based on worst worst case assumption. So for example, uh, when we sample a key, the difficulty of breaking our scheme will be the difficulty of breaking a random instance of our uh, of our problem. 
So what we want to do is to say, okay, I want to prove that there is a distribution in which I can sample the key, which is as difficult as the worst time, or as the worst case instance. So how do we do that? Well, we are going to make a worst case to average case uh, reduction. I take some worst case basis for module USP of rank two. I'm going to shuffle it enough to make it random. Well, uh, random meaning independent of the entry, of the input. And once it is independent from the input, then I can uh, deshuffle and I can uh, run my oracle and then deshuffle the solution in order to have back uh, the worst case uh, the worst case solution. So that's what I'm going to present uh, now. So first, uh, let's see the anatomy of uh, module UZP of rank two instance. So that's the QR factorization. Le let's say that I have the best basis for my uh, for my uh, module UZP of rank two instance. So I can make the QR factorization of this one, and it will look like that: one short vector here, B one, and one very long vector B two. And I can uh, reduce B two by B one in order to make uh, this uh, R one two. Uh, define modulo R11. So I have four variables, Q, which is a rotation, uh, R11, R R22, which are the, basically the, the length of, uh, the, of our two vectors, and R12, which is uh, the angle between the two. So uh, the goal for the randomization is to randomize Q, R11, R22, and R12. The thing is, we don't have access to this basis yet, right? Because if we did, well, the problem will be solved. So uh, first, so I'm going to try to and, uh, and randomize everything without the knowledge, without access to it. So first, randomization of R11 and R22. Uh, how do I randomize R11 and R22? Basically, I want to multiply them by random primes. So first, I can multiply my whole module by a random prime. And uh, okay, so R11 and R22 are going to be random, and I'm happy. But the thing is, they are, they will not be uh, random uh, in the, randomly. Uh, they will not be randomized independently. So, uh, for example, if I multiply all my module by P, well, R11 divided by R22 will always be equal to the same thing. So uh, I want to multiply R11 and not R22. This is going to be done by sparsification. So sparsification is uh, something that has already been used in lattice-based cryptography and in uh, reductions, uh, for example, in the context of CVP reductions. So the idea is to say, I take a prime, and I'm going to choose at random and direction, and to keep only one point out of this prime. So if my prime is P, I am going to take one point out of P and, um, and discard the others. So this is uh, shown in this, uh, in this uh, image. So I have this blue lattice, and I only keep the red dots. So we can prove that doing so, you don't change R22 that much with high probability, but you are going to have R11, which is the shortest vector of your sparsified lattice, is going to be multiplied by this prime that you choose. So you won. You, uh, you multiplied R11 and not R22. So that's cool. Now we still have uh, R12, so this, uh, this angle, this, uh, this thing to, uh, to randomize. And the idea is the following. We are going to sample some Gaussian, some Gaussian matrix, and to multiply on the left by it. So geometri geometrically, what does it mean? It means that every point of the lattice is going to be shuffled a bit, uh, not too far, in, uh, in some direction. So basically, this is shown in this, uh, in this picture. Uh, this point is going to be moved a bit. Uh, you can uh, you can do that mathematically, compute everything, etc. So what we do basically is we add some Gaussian noise into R12. But R12, as I said before, is defined modulo R11. So since R11 is a very short vector, which was uh, our assumption with modulo unique SVB, right? Uh, well, just adding a little Gaussian noise is going to be like uniform is going to make it uh, not far statistically from uniform. So by adding uh, some, uh, some small noise, we make R12 uniform, and we even randomize uh, the, uh, the, the rotation matrix, since multiplying by a rotation matrix is, uh, and then, wait, on the other side, uh, multiplying by a Gaussian and a rotation matrix is the same as multiplying by a Gaussian, and that's all. So here, 
we won. We randomized R11, R22 uh, in the previous slide. Here, we just randomized R12 and Q in this slide. So we won, we've got a worst case to average case reduction. Well, not exactly yet. Because uh, all the operation we did on our bad basis, on the basis we were given at the beginning. But maybe in the basis uh, we have at the end, we have uh, information about the randomization. Maybe we kept information and uh, so uh, Oracle could use it. This is not perfectly independent of what happened before. And uh, we can't use uh, anymore the uh, the okay. uh, we can't use anymore the uh, the Hermit normal form in order to discard everything because now we are uh, we multiplied by Gaussians so we are in the continuous world we don't have any more polynomials which coefficient in Z we have to somehow round our, our module so how are we going to do that well we are going to uh, to do what we call a uh, Gaussian uh, Gaussian uh, Gaussian rounding, which is we are going to compute a basis of the dual of our uh, module. We are uh, we are going to compute uh, this ba uh, basis of that and to sample two points in the dual, which are very orthogonal. Since those points, and uh, we are going to take the matrix of uh, of those two points and to multiply on the left by it. Since those points are orthogonal, this is going to not change the geometry of our lattice very much because it is uh, almost an uh, identity matrix, right? And since we are in the dual of our lattice, well, multiplying on the left by those points is going to round everything because, uh, because of the definition of the dual. So doing so, th this is an adaptation of uh, the, uh, the rounding uh, in uh, the uh, uh, Kundebourg, um, Alice Pelé-Marie, Léo Duca, and uh, Benjamin Veselovsky's uh, paper about uh, auricular random work, uh, but generalized in uh, the in two dimensions so by doing so we get a lattice uh, a module in uh, with integer entries and we can use hermit normal form and we lose every information uh, we did along the way and then uh, we won now we have a real reduction uh, from uh, from a worst case to average case for module is equal rank two okay so i did hide uh, quite a lot of things so first uh, first thing uh, we worked about number field all along, so you have to take care of some number theoretic stuff uh, during the whole, uh, the whole thing. Uh, the modules are not necessarily free, so uh, you get to use a module uh, ideal SVP solver uh, in some case. Uh, this uh, Hermit normal for, uh, step uh, can take uh, the decay of two uh, numbers of repetition, and in some cases, the decay of two is uh, exponential in the degree of the field. So uh, that's another thing. Uh, and I also hide the uh, polynomial losses approximation factor and the uh, distribution analysis which uses Rennie di divergence and the statistical distance which was a bit uh, complicated uh, so yeah just uh, to so now um, what we showed is that all this blob of uh, of problems so uh, intro module usp in rank 2 etc all these things are equivalent and uh, so i leave you with some important problem uh, so first uh, we need ideal SVP oracle in order to make some reduction, which leads to a distribution for entry instances in which we can't really sample right now. So uh, one thing would be to uh, to try and find a, a sampleable uh, entry distribution with uh, worst case hardness. Uh, the composability for reduction with the entry search decision from uh, Pelé Marie Stelle 21 is not uh, yet proven. And uh, for the most for for the most uh, number theoretic guys uh, and girls uh, around here, uh, uh, determining which uh, number fields verify that uh, the decay of two is polynomial is is not uh, is not that easy. So thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any question, uh, feel free to reach me. We have time for one quick question. I have um, how do you find the uh, quasi orthogonal basis in the dual just for the rounding? Uh, are you speaking about uh, this, uh, this? That one, the one after this step. Okay, so first we compute uh, a basis for the uh, with LLL for the for the dual. 
And then we sample uh, Gaussian with Gaussian, uh, Gaussian sampling, two points uh, that are uh, quasi orthogonal. So first, the first one is sampled uh, very close, like centered around, uh, I don't know, uh, here it would be uh, lambda one zero. And uh, we sample here. And the second is sampled very near to uh, zero, uh, zero lambda for some big lambda. And then we get uh, two points that are almost orthogonal because they are very close to uh, because they are very close to one zero yeah, and zero yeah. one. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you come back to the slide on and true? Yeah. Yeah. So this one. So I'm a bit confused because in the original and true, this is not the ring we're using. We're using x to the n minus one, and n is a prime. So I was wondering, does your work apply also to the actual and true or only to this variation? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, here I I chosen to present it for x to the n plus one for uh, for some uh, like uh, power to cyclotomics, but uh, our work generalizes to any number fields actually, and uh, we've got uh, different losses and different uh, running times depending on the discriminant of the number field depending on. Uh, I think that's just all, it's like the discriminant of the number field and the degree. So uh, this, um, the, I, I presented for uh, x to the 2 to the r plus 1, but uh, it works for the original n true. It works for n true prime. It works for, I don't know, uh, multi quadratic n true if the, uh, such thing exists. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Okay, so now our next talk is going to be given online. It's about a non heuristic approach to time space trade off and optimization for BKW by Hanlin Liu and Yu Yu. And the talk will be given by Hanlin. Uh, thanks for your introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Hanlin Liu from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Today, I'm presenting our work on the BKW algorithm. This is a joint work with my advisor, Professor Yu Yu. The LPM problem has two versions, the search LPM problem and the decisional LPM problem. The search LPM problem is to figure out the secret X, given the public matrix A and the noise code word Y. Both the public matrix A and the secret X are, uniform, are, are uniformly random. The noise E needs to be sparse. It is follows component wise independent Bologna distribution. In cryptography, more attention is paid to in cryptography, more attention is paid to the decisional LPN problem, which is to distinguish LPN sample and the random sample. Two versions are polynomial equivalent. The hardness of the the hardness of the LPM problems varies based on the noise well. In the standard LPM problem, the noise well is constant, meaning that it is independent of the independent, uh, independent, independent of the dimension. The best known attack is the BKW algorithm. The BKW algorithm is the first spatial algorithm to solve the constant noise LPM problem. Both the time and the sample complexity are two to n over log n. The huge space, the huge sample complexity limits the application of the BKW algorithm. So Lubachevsky reduced the sample complexity to a smaller polynomial. However, the time complexity is increased to two to n over log log n. We mainly focus on optimizing the BKW algorithm. And the low noise LPM problems is not the focus of our paper. Here we recall the process of the BKW algorithm. Suppose that we have the LPM samples. The matrix is a random matrix A, and the next dot color is a noise code word 
AX plus E. First, we can divide the LPN samples into different groups based on, on the view of the first B bits of the matrix A. There are two to the B different groups. In each group, the first B of the coefficients have the sum view. Secondly, for each group, we XOR the first row with the rest of rows, so that the first B bits of the coefficients are all zero. Finally, we measure, measure all results, so we can get the LPN samples with a reduced dimension and a double noise. Double noise means that the resulting noise is XOR of two previous noise. Moreover, by, by doing, we lose the two to be samples because in each group, the first samples is dropped out and they are two to be different groups. All we show is the first iteration in each iteration. The dimension of the LPN problem is reduced by B bits and the double noise. We can do N over B iterations and reduce the dimension of the LPN problems to one. We summarize the LPN, uh, the main idea of the BKW algorithm. After N over B iterations, we figure out two to N over B vectors, which sums up to a unit vector. And the final noise is the sum of two to N over B initial noise. The final noise is so huge, and we need to repeat the above process many times on the fresh new samples. The fresh new samples can guarantee that the independence of the final noise. Finally, we do a majority votes to figure out the first bit of the secret. The process of recovering the other bit of the secret is like wells. For example, we analyze the complexity of the BKW algorithm to solve the LPN problems with a constant noise. Space complexity is a two to B. Both the time and the sample complexity are two to B times two to two to N over log N. To, in order to minimize the time complexity, we have to set B as N over log N to make two terms in the sum old. So, the time and the space complexity all keep two to n over log n. Actually, there are some questions. First, the BKW algorithm has a huge space and a sample complexity. So the BKW algorithm will benefit from some trade-off to make it more practical. For example, time space trade-off and the sample and the time samples trade-off. Question number two, there are enough walls in the first step, but the walls are not independent. In order to get independent walls, the BKW algorithm needs to repeat the first step many times. So how to remove the repeat step and save the corresponding fact? Recently, ESO et al. proposed the time-based trade-off for the BKW algorithm. We record the process of this trade-off. First, we pick C minus one rules from the LPN public LPN samples and XOR they together. Secondly, we figure out another samples whose first bits have the same view as the result of the first sample step. Finally, we XOR two samples to get a new samples and loop many times to get enough new samples. All we showed is the first iteration. In each iteration, the dimension is reduced by B bits and the resulting noise is the same of C previous noise. Notice that the resulting samples are not mutually independent. So, they introduced an uh, independence heuristic to fix it. After many iterations, we reduced the dimension of LPN problems to one. 
so that we can discover the corresponding coordinate. This is algorithm. This algorithm is called the Lev system BKW algorithm. They optimize it by decisional technique and quantum algorithm. The main contribution of our work is a framework to optimize the BKW algorithm. Compared with the single list in the original BKW algorithm, we have many lists. These lists are mutually independent. Within each list, we only require that all vectors are pairwise independent. The rest of step are the same as the original BKW algorithm. We prove that the pairwise independent were preserved from all leaves down to root. Thanks to the pairwise independent, they can analyze the complexity of all algorithms without using any heuristic. At the same time, our algorithm does not need to repeat step and only do majority vote in the list L in the list 2 1. So we reduced the time complexity of the original BKW algorithm by a substantial factor. We give an example to show how to preserve the pairwise independent. Suppose the list L, zero, I are mutual independent and within each list, all vectors are pairwise independent. It is easy to show. Mm, so we know that the within list L11, all vectors are also pairwise independent. It is easy to show that if the size of list L0i are a lot less than 2 to b plus 1 over c minus 1. So by chip shift inequality, the size of list L11 have the sum bound. We showed that all list in the, in the second level are also mutually independent because the short list are mutually independent. Using the sound well, we can analyze the humming weight of the noise from all leaves down to the root. So we only do the majority vote in the list L21 to recover the secret of LPM. With the help of our framework, we get a sound result as the work of SO at all, but without use the any heuristic. We introduce the C to do the time space trade off. If the C equal to two, then the complexity of our algorithm is the same as that of our, the original BKW algorithm. If we increase the C, we get a large time space, a larger time complexity, and a smaller spa space complexity. We can also use the decision decision technique and the quantum algorithm to further optimize our algorithm. Beta is also used to adjusting the time space trade-off. Our algorithm can optimize the time space complexity of the original BKW algorithm. We compare of our algorithm and with the original BKW algorithm and the recent work of David Das et al. We can save a sub exponential fact. Duba Chifsky introduced a, a sample amplifier to reduce the sample complexity to a smaller polynomial, such as n over n to one plus epsilon, while epsilon is a constant. First, they randomly pick many W triples from n to one plus epsilon sample. Secondly, X or each W triples as a real LPN sample. By leftover hash lemma, 
when set W is equal to N over log N, then the LPN, the new LPN sample is very close to the real LPN sample. Finally, invoke the original BKW algorithm to recover the secret of the LPN problem. Our sample amplifier is a little different. First, we split the LPN sample into a log N group, and each group has a sum size. Second, for each group, we pick all W triples and XOR each W triples. So we get each list from each group. Then the list are mutually independent, and within each list, all vectors are pairwise independent. W is equal to n over log n times log log n in our algorithm. Finally, we invoke our optimized optimize two sum BKW algorithm to recover the secret of LPN problem. Compare, compare with the Lubachevsky trade off, we can save a sub exponential factor. This is all. Thank you. For one quick question. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. The final talk of this session is improving bound on elliptic curve hidden number problem for ECDH key exchange by Junsu, Santanu Saka, Hua Xiong Wang, and Lei Hu. And the talk, I believe, will be given by Junsu. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Junxu. I'm from Institute of Information Engineering. Chinese Academy of Science. The co-authors are Santam Sakar, Hua Xiong Wang, and Lei Hu. Now let me talk about our paper. The title is Improving Bounds on Elliptic Curve Hidden Number Problem, for short, ECHMP for ECDH King Exchange. ECHMP can be first introduced by Dambula, Halloway, and Hargrave at Aaron 2001 in order to expect the result of bit security for ECDH. At PKC 2017, Shining introduced a development version of ECHMP called ECHMPX or Shani's ECHMP. Shining obtained the first rigorous bit security result of ECDH on a fixed curve. Similar to HMP, Shani's ECHMP can be used for crypt analysis of ECDH king exchange in the case of side channel attacks. Now, let me uh, introduce the uh, definition of ECHMPX for a given elliptical curve over prime field, a given point R. So R is public and a positive data. And let P is a hidden point in a given elliptical uh, curve. Let the O the uh, uh, oracle on put M and outputs the data MSB of the X coordinate of P plus M multiply R. 
So uh, we know the partial information of a hidden point P plus M multiply M. The goal is to recall the hidden point P <clears throat> given the current access to the oracle O. The rotation delta over log P means the output fraction of X called outlet bit per iteration. And the previous result at a PKC 2017, a rigorous bound five over six was put forward use a direct lattice method. At the DCC paper, a heuristic bound one over two was given use the Cobb-Smith method. Clearly, the one over two bound is better. So the question is how to improve the one over two bound. Uh, in this worker, we give the following result. Let D be a only given positive integer, given a enough large prime. Um, the ECHMP problem can be heuristically solved when the bound, when the bound is one over D plus one. Our method is a polynomial time in the log P for the only constant D. When D greater than one, the bound, our bound one over D plus one is better. Furthermore, uh, we showed that one can heuristically compute all the bits for a given elliptical curve over the prime field. If the oracle outputs any constant fraction of the MSB of the X, Coordinate. However, in the previous work, only for some constant function, such as PKC gives the five over six, DCC give one over two. Now, let me uh, introduce how to transform uh, this problem uh, from Shannon's ECHMP to the modular polynomials. Mm, recall the X coordinate of the hidden point P can be transformed into the problem of the finding the desired small root of the modular polynomials, Fi. Fi, the monomials is one X zero, X zero square, Yi, X, zero square uh, multiply yi, x zero square multiply yi. And where x zero is a common variable, the coefficient, the coefficients are knowing the integers, the integers e zero and so on are unknowing. They are bound by a value big X big X is equals P over two to prime delta. The corresponding analysis was given by Shani at PKC. So our goal is to recover the desired route in the polynomial time, such that the bound big X is as large as possible. For a fixed prime P, big X, the bound, becomes larger if and only if delta, the lowing bits delta, becomes small because of big X equals P over two to delta. We revised the Cobb-Smith method to save the Shannon's ECHMP. The Cobb-Smith method was proposed by Cobb-Smith in the 1996. The Cobb-Smith method have the many applications, such as cryptanalysis of RSA, a tank of sold random number generator, 
and so on. In the Copson method, they have an uh, important notion of the helpful polynomial. So G is a helpful polynomial uh, if its diagonal element is bound by the mode P to power D. So a helpful polynomial is added to the lattice. It makes the Cobb-Smith condition easier to satisfy. In other words, the more helpful polynomials, the larger the bound X. Compared to DCC paper, we construct enough helpful polynomials. Concretely speaking, for a fixed tube G1, G2, and so on, we consider some linear combination of the following polynomial. This polynomial is a product of several original, original polynomials. So uh, the polynomial in the expression two are usually called shift polynomials in the Cobb-Smith Cobb method. So we construct some uh, linear combination of the shift polynomials. And such linear combinations can be proved to be a helpful polynomials. Furthermore, the number of these helpful polynomials is n choose d plus one, which is a dominant in the total number. This is the key to our work. For example, a small example, given two original uh, polynomials, f1, f2, his monomial is one, zero, x0, zero, x0 zero square, yi, x0 multiply yi, x0 square multiply yi. We construct a linear combination of the following polynomials, f1, f2, f0 multiply f1, f0 multiply f2, y1 multiply f2, y2 multiply f1, f0 multiply f2 multiply y1, f0 multiply f1 multiply f y2. So the possible monomials are divided two parts, the blue parts and the, the red parts. In the linear combination, the monomials with red color are missing. In other words, the red parts are disappeared. So in the linear combination, they are monomials are one x zero y one x zero multiply y one y two x zero multiply y two y one multiply y two. The leading term is y one y two. And let me, let me give a lattice for the, this the example. We construct a triangle basis matrix. This is a four, uh, is a seven, seven polynomials where the G7 is above linear combination, linear combination. So the lattice L is bound by the coefficient vector of gi, i from one to seven. Uh, we can compute, compute the lattice. A determinant is equals uh, p to power six multiply big X multiply um, two uh, power nine. The dimension is a seven, is a seven. Based on the Cobb-Smith condition, we get the, the bound big X is smaller than P to power one over line. Note that the diagonal element of G7, diagonal element is 
x big x square is smaller than p to power two over nine. This is smaller than p. So p seven is a helpful polynomial. We use the enough helpful polynomial and get the final bound is big X is smaller than P to power one minus one over D plus one because of X equals P over two to delta. In other words, delta over log P is greater than one over D plus one for any positive integer D. But the best bound from DCC pep is big X is smaller than P to power one minus one over two. It means a data over log P is greater than one over two. So uh, this works bound is significantly better than a DCC pep bound because D greater than one, uh, greater than one. Um, this bound is better than one over two. But um, our method is a uh, heuristic because to uh, compute the desired root, we use the uh, grouper basis. In the, this process, we need the following assumption. And this assumption mean uh, is the zero dimension ideal. It means uh, the common, these polynomials are common roots. The lump of the common roots is a finite. Uh, this is a typical assumption for the Cobb Smith method. In this paper, we justify uh, the heuristics by the uh, experiments use the small dimension of lattice. So uh, conclusion, we uh, significantly improved the bound for the seven shellies ECHMP. Because of heuristic in the Cobb-Smith method, we did a lot get the rigorous speed security result. That's all, thank you for your attention. We have time for one question. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.